Welcome to the holiday edition of Three Squares. Only Susan looks festive in her in her red. Kevin and I, not so much, but that's okay. Uh, Charlie Arnott with the Center for Food Integrity and Look East, working to keep food trustworthy, and my colleagues, Susan Schwally, Kevin Ryan. You going to introduce yourselves? Sure, Susan Schwally, NPD, soon to merge with IRI. Next time you hear from me, we'll have a new name. You won't be um, Susan anymore? What name are you going to choose? No, I'll Susan? still be Susan. Oh, okay. I'll still right. be Susan. We're going to have a fancy new name. I don't know what it's going to be. Maybe fancy it'll be like Datativity name. or something. Exciting. Oh, you gave it away. We heard it here I know. First. Yeah, it's not Datativity. I study what people eat and I love it. Kevin, well, who is are there you? A mix? Maybe you could mix together the NPD and IRI. I'm trying, I'm trying to like think of what can we an, an anagram there? Is there something yeah, there with IRI? And in, we should work on that during the show. We'll see what other kind awesome. of companies we can, we could come we can up with. We can workshop it. We just need an awesome it. company. We could workshop we'll, it. We'll have some synergy, right? <laughs> right. We'll, we'll increase its functionality. We exactly. will. And then we will socialize the new name. It'll be great. Right. Uh, Kevin Ryan, uh, Malachi Strategy and Research, uh, helping uh, CPG and food service with front-end innovation. Okay, we were just sharing our uh, distaste and uh, for for jargon, so we'll try to avoid that if we can throughout the rest of the, of the show. So uh, on this holiday edition of, of Three Squares, first of all, happy holidays to each and every one of you, whatever holiday you choose to celebrate. You hope you enjoy it with family and friends. Uh, rather than doing kind of the typical holiday or end-of-year list, uh, we thought we'd dive a little deeper into a handful of topics that that are might be a little more interesting because you've got some disparate perspectives and points of view on these. And Kevin, you you talked about this earlier this week, and I think it was really interesting. Um, you know, historically, we think about black swan events as being that once in a decade, once in a generation, maybe once in a lifetime kind of event. But you talked about the increasingly frequent black swan events, and I thought it was really, really interesting. So you want to kick us off with your perspective on that, and then we'll, we'll jump in. Yeah, I mean, I think um, for those of you who are unfamiliar, black swan, uh, a title uh, put out there, a name put out there, I think about 20 years ago by uh, Nassim Taleb, if, you, if you're familiar, uh, a, a good thinker, a great thinker, actually, strategic thinker. And basically, as to your point, it's, it's events that are shocking no one thought of and that have major ripples. I think, if anything, I think that the the uh, pandemic made us all aware of potential for black swans and how, you know, they could affect us. But then also, you know, things like 9-11 and all that, you know, those are the events. So I think people get kind of, we're, we're primed now to think, what are the, what's the next big events that are going to greatly impact us that we're not thinking of? Um, and, you know, as I think to the new year, and of course, I start thinking about black swans and, you know, and it, as you look to black swans, you think, okay, well, there were some precursors, like people were saying that a pandemic was coming. There were mm -hmm. aspects of terrorism before, right? So it's like, what could be coming next? And, you know, the ones that pop to mind for me are we're seeing little, uh, you know, uh, signals, weak signals, I should say, of crop collapse. Uh, with like, we've all heard about the snow crabs, a billion snow crabs disappearing, mm -hmm. lettuce not being available for Subway and uh, a couple of other big chains because of that. Uh, potatoes, we've heard that too, you know, so there's that. Um, also, the other event that I think we're starting to see, or at least, uh, and again, these are really negative, so I hope we don't see them, but um, attacks in the U.S. on the um, infrastructure uh, mm -hmm. on, and, 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 if you think about that, just infrastructure in general, the other weaknesses in, in our infrastructure, and I think our food industry relies a lot on trust. Uh, it relies a lot on the idea that no one is going to mess with a shipment of grain. No one is going to mess with this. I mean, those kind of events, those are you know really scary, but have to be thought of. Mm -hmm. And we're starting yeah. to see over in Ukraine, right? Right. Right. I yeah, think that's the other big one. Shipments. Yeah. Yeah. It's just, uh, it's really interesting. And I think when, when you, when you kind of play that out and see the impact, clearly uh, the increase in anxiety across consumers and across several sectors where people are increasingly concerned about my health and my ability to access food. But then it's also interesting to think about the impact on supply chains and whether it's crop collapse or interruptions because of Russia's invasion in Ukraine or, or, or um, the real focus on resiliency Yes. And what do we do to create some resiliency without increasing redundancy? And I think that's really been a fascinating thing that we've seen over the last 24 months as companies have been leaning into that. And there are some positive aspects that will come from that, right? Where people will be able to find 
uh, different formulations, different sourcing, which then gives us the option of saying, okay, is there is there a more sustainable option? Is there a healthier option? Is there something else that actually has a beneficial outcome? So in addition to the dark side of this, it does drive some innovation and creativity. Exactly. Right, because you have to adjust. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, Talib talks about it as anti-fragile. Uh, mm -hmm. And that's how he talked about, uh, you know, companies need to become anti-fragile. And I think you're seeing that with some companies are starting to invest more in that early phase from a CPG perspective, an early phase, how do they protect themselves? I think against exactly what you're talking about, supply chain, as well as other things. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Interesting. Do you see that movement in ag where people are maybe expanding the amount of supply? I mean, I, you know, you hear about it in tech all the time with building mm -hmm. plants in India, Vietnam, not just being in China. Like, are we doing that locally where companies are going with more, more, smaller? I, I don't know. How does that play out? Yeah, I, th I think there are a number of things that are, that are happening. One is um, companies are, are embracing technology that maybe had shied away from it before. So talking to some of the global food companies, if they use commodities that may be at risk, uh, they may be more willing to embrace technology like gene editing to be able to create crops that are more drought tolerant or more resistant or carry um, additional protection against pests or offer additional nutritional benefits, whatever it happens to be. Um, you know, people are looking for many different solutions to create that resiliency. Uh, because to Kevin's point, what the, the traditional outcome would be, okay, if I can no longer plant X here, I'll plant Y instead. Mm -hmm. uh, but people are now looking at it and say, well, I, I, I actually need X in my supply chain. So do I plant that somewhere else? And if the climate isn't hospitable to that, how do I adjust the crop's expectations so that it can thrive here? Or what else can I do? So there's just a, there's a, there's a lot of work taking place. And, um, you know, the amount of capital that's flowing into ag tech development is, is impressive uh, yeah. and really interesting. Remember, we talked to um, Mike, um, what's his last name? Uh, McCloskey. From, uh, McCloskey. And he talked about... Mm -hmm. uh, uh, the, the, the efforts of, of breeding cattle in trop in the tropics oh, right? yeah. and things right. like that, like that, I think that kind of, I mean, it's a little bit further out there, but the idea of growing grains where you before weren't able to grow grains mm -hmm. or growing grains with different functionality, like you're seeing higher protein wheat or higher protein oats or whatever. I mean, that type of thinking, I think that resiliency to Charlie's point, that's what I think. And also, uh, companies that are are being more um, dynamic in the way in which they produce goods or ability to produce goods. So, so I remember we were talking about before about how General Mills was talking about we have 40 different versions of to make pizza rolls. Right. That's right. another way to be more resilient. One of the other uh, consequences of that, however, if you think about what's happening with climate change, um, you know, people are now farming the permafrost uh, yeah. and that has some negative consequences. Mm -hmm. uh, because climate change is allowing that, but the, uh, the phenomenal amount of carbon has been stored in the permafrost that's now being uh, exposed. So it's just a very, very dynamic environment. But I think uh, as we've seen these series of black swan events, whether it's the, the pandemic and then the invasion of Ukraine or, 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 and, and, and uh, it's forcing more adaptability and innovation, which at the end of the day will create some, some new solutions. Yeah. We need to bring back woolly mammoths. Is really woolly really mammoths. Really. No, no. <laughs> Have you not seen this? This big whole and wild. The the uh, extinctions. There, like there is some efforts to say that the permafrost, its its health, is because it no longer has any megafauna, and the woolly mammoths need to be back because it helps to protect. Mm. Uh, I mean, this I, is it's, a lot it's like a, Jurassic Park. I'm or, sure this well, won't no, end well. I think the theory is more like reintroducing wolves into Yellowstone. Right? Yeah, no, there's a, that's that's less actually, extreme. Right. Less extreme. There, but I like did it. you I see? Want... There's um a couple species on Galapagos they thought were extinct that have come back because they reintroduced some other animals and there were just enough of them lurking around. Mm -hmm. I just read about this. Yeah, mm -hmm. I mean, yeah. it's it's kind of you know funny to say oh woolly mammoth and things like that, but I mean even to the point of what other species we can help reintroduce to help uh, the, the environment. Uh, I mean, I think that companies are, and at least, uh, you know, maybe even governments are going to have to start thinking about that to help improve the, um, you know, food supply in many well, ways. Maybe the woolly mammoth will become the next elite pet for those who really want to have an elite pet. I, it was for the Flintstones. It's really big. It is big. It is it's big. hairy. Have have very, it's smelly. You have to have a very large yard. But see, we lived yard. with and the then covenants. Weeds. I mean, would would your covenants even allow them? Really? No, probably not. <laughs> My HOA, HOA would not. My no, HOA no, is no, not. No, 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 but yeah. humans live with woolly mammoths. It's not like 
dinosaurs. Did they right? ride them? Yeah. Did they tame them? I'm sure they did. It was only 10,000 years ago they disappeared. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. well, look, this black swan thing could be good because one theme, I mean, and some inventions could be good coming out of it because holidays are proving a little tough for retailers because there's not a lot of innovation and new news. Everyone's mm -hmm. been focused on just kind of getting the stuff out there. Yeah. So we need the innovation cycle to, to uptick um, yeah. beyond just keeping stuff on the shelves. Yeah. Well, that's everyone always shuts down innovation during these times, which is probably the worst time to shut right. down innovation, but I don't blame them. I can see why. Yeah. Yeah. Then they all come running back. They're like, oh my gosh, where's the innovation right. when right. they yeah. need it? It's all cyclical. Um, it is that's going to be this year. All right. Yeah, so that'll good, be this year. good segue, year. Kevin. Innovation, artificial intelligence, driving innovation, creating some mm. opportunity for innovation. You, you turned us on in your last newsletter to this new artificial intelligence that is fascinating and a little bit terrifying. You want to share a little more? Yeah. So there's a, a company that's currently for-profit. It's started as a nonprofit, actually co-founded by Elon Musk and Peter Thiel, actually. Hmm. Now a for-profit called OpenAI. And they have a number of uh, products that they have uh, beta released to the public. One is uh, ChatGPT. The other is Dolly2. ChatGPT is like, it's a conversational AI that you can type in and it will very convincingly respond to <laughs> any topic. Uh, Dolly too is you can just offer it up, a, you know, make this picture and it'll make a picture, which is fascinating. But you're, it's getting a lot of buzz and it's getting a lot of buzz because of how human it is in its response and also what kind of uh, impact it could have on all of us because it is so quote unquote smart. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so we, we've put it to the test over the last few days, asking it questions in our professional spheres from strategy to recipes to poetry. Mm -hmm. so, so, Kevin, do you want do you want to share the the, the poetry that yeah, you the poetry. derived from from this? And first of all, Susan, you got to provide you you got to give it you got to give us a lead into this because it's your obsession or fascination with aspic that led to yeah. this. Yeah, aspic, all things encased in gelatinous goo, yeah. um, and not you know, I mean back. Jello is great, but Jello from the fifties and then prior to that, you know, like suspended fish heads in the Middle Ages, and 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 Kevin taught us on earlier episodes a lot about why it was a sign of your culinary prowess and your wealth because you had these molds, these copper molds you hung on the wall, and you were able to make this stuff clear and not cloudy and nasty, and um, there was some importance to it nutritionally. Was there like? protein or something in the, the gelatin i mean it is it is protein but i think it was just like to your point i think it was just more show and yeah style that you could especially because yeah. you would need a, a whole raft of people to make it previously and you did yeah to get it to yeah right because you didn't yeah. have jello but then you know along comes facebook and then people start posting what was that group that i used to look at all the time like aspic that makes me shiver or something anyway yeah. Um, so I started sharing my love of all things aspic and, and it's always a topic between the three of us. So Kevin, you asked it to write a I did. poem. This is the first time I've ever read. I was like, I, I heard people writing, saying that they were asking chat GPT to write a poem, uh, which seems like, you know, super creative to do. And I said, write a poem about aspic. Right. And it returned something that I was pretty, I was like, wow, that's pretty good. I don't know if I could yeah, do that absolutely. well. So really quickly, and it's, it's you know, four quatrains here. So uh, aspic, oh, aspic, a curious treat, a jelly delight, both savory and sweet, a mixture of flavors encased in a shell, a culinary uh, creation that's quite hard to sell. Uh, it glistens and gleams with a shine so bright, a rainbow of hues that catch the light. It quivers and wobbles with every move, a wobbly delight that's hard to approve. But oh, how it tastes when it's done right, a burst of flavors that take flight, a blend of meats and vegetables all in one bite, a taste sensation that's truly a delight. So let's raise a toast to Aspic, the dish, a culinary masterpiece that we'll, we can all, all should cherish. For though it may seem a little bit odd, it's a treat that's truly worth celebrating with a nod. Now, well done, well done. We need to get if, Vincent Price to read that, I think. Oh, yes, exactly. <laughs> that, that would be good. Here's the thing is, I mean, I know that that's kind of, people are probably like shaking their head going, why are we talking about aspect? But what's interesting <laughs> is, think about what it had to do to get to that. It had to, number one, understand what aspect was, that people don't like it, because it mentions right. that. Mm -hmm. right. It's it's attributes, that it, it wobbles, and it's savory and yes. sweet. 
I mean, there's so much embedded and in it. There. There's a lot of nuance. There's a lot of and nuance. It there's a lot of nuance. Yeah. And it rhymes and it has meter. I mean, it's there's a lot in there. So um, and it did it in what, like 10 seconds, 15 seconds to spit it back out to you? Yeah, yeah, yeah. it was seconds. So uh, yeah, and I mean, of course, you can do this with lots of other things. As as Charlie mentioned, we've been playing around with it, just asking it very serious innovation, business questions. strategy questions, business questions. And it's returning stuff that I, if if I had like a first year business student return that to me, I'd be like, yeah, that's that's pretty good. I mean, it's not super in-depth, and in, 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 but it's, it's good. It's yeah. good. Yeah. Yeah. By the way, Susan, I I figured out the right way to combine the letters to come up with a name. It's oh. dr dripping, dripping, dripping. You are dripping. I with, with NPD I, and IRI. There you go. I'm, when we get off this uh, webinar, I'm gonna I'm gonna make some phone calls to the marketing. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I think that's the new name for the guy. Hey, I should put it in chat. GPT. Or I, I think you should. I, I can't should. get in. It's there's only a million <laughs> slots. I'm on the wait list. So I. That's oh. why. I asked you to ask it the 2023 top food and beverage trends. Yes. And yeah. you told me that I get to keep my job. Yes. I think they're, they're directionally correct. They're directionally. good, but they don't have too much depth. No. Right. Uh, right. But, uh, but, but yeah, still. I mean, overall though, I mean, I think it really speaks to a lot of implications for business uh, and, and for consumers. I mean, if I think about what's the future with conversational bots of this type of intelligence yep. uh think about every person having their own personalized ch chat gpt that's been trained to them to tell them this is the type of restaurant you're going to like this is the type of food you should like this is the, what you should be making for dinner is that a chat bot or is that an algorithm or is it the same i think it's the same yeah, I think it's the same. But then you connect it to all the rest of the devices that exist today. And so whether you're asking Siri or Alexa, then boom, you've got the answer and it's right there. I mean, I think it's, right. it's, it really, it's, it's foreshadowing something pretty exciting. Yeah. Yeah. Because now if you ask, well, well, yes. all of the above. What right? if but someone I mean, starts controlling that? Uh, well, that's well, true. Then, then you, then you have an action series that will show up on Netflix. Well, but I also ask too, is like, <laughs> if you teach it all of your likes, say that you only like these things and these things, how much differentiation are you going to get off of that? Right. Is That's it going right. to push people further into a taste bubble? Yes. Or can you, can you ask it, you know what? I want to be different sometimes. Give me 10% radicalness in my choice. I mean, the future is really interesting in that way. And also how will brands get access to that? Or right. can they ever get access? And also, will brands be communicating with the person or with the chatbot? Via the chatbot. Yeah. Well, like if well, I'm it's selling- the inputs to the chatbot, That's right? right. Yeah. I'm going to be able to sell to the chatbot. Right. Like right now, the chatbot's closed, right? Mm -hmm. But the mm -hmm. idea is it would be feeding from- like, But if we're not- oh, I'm going to be able to look dramatic. If kids don't need to write term papers well, that's, or learn to yeah. read and write- and now who's putting input out there into the internet 10 years from now, are we still going to be swirling the same, same stale stuff around the chat bot? Yeah. Yeah. Good point. Right. Because it, it, it has to feed off, off of inputs still at this point, at this point, at this I mean, point, I, at the, you could assume a future where it could create its own connections mm -hmm. uh, based on former inputs. I, I mean, I think it's, I think it's really fascinating. It scares me more than anything else, just because I, maybe I'm paranoid, but it's the whole thing of we've seen just what's happened with social media, with algorithms and when bad actors get it and what they can do to amplify. Mm -hmm. So now if you have this kind of pe people are going to do stuff they're not supposed to do. Um, it's a whole other level of potential misinformation. Um, but I, I, I mean, you know, everything has a pro and con to it. Yeah. 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 Well, that's another good segue, Susan. Let's, let's transition a little bit into polarization fatigue oh, yeah. and, um, you know, predatory algorithms have mm -hmm. driven us all to something less than informed dialogue and, and encouraged mm -hmm. each of us to simply continue to live in an echo chamber where we are fed the, uh, the information that enrages instead of informs as we continue to engage in a conversation. But I think there's a little, there's a little, a glimmer of hope on the horizon in a, in a recent poll from PBS, Marist, and uh, NPR, where they said that 74% of Americans uh, in December, up from 64% in February of last year, 10% change in a national survey over, over 10 months. That's huge. Mm -hmm. That's a big shift. 
Uh, but 74 percent now say it's more important for government officials in Washington to compromise to find solutions rather than to stand on principle. So 74 percent of Americans uh, prioritize compromise. What's distressed, so th that's the good news, right? You've got three quarters of the country saying, come on, we've got to find a way to work together. This is this is ridiculous where we are today. Um, but 58 percent have no confidence that Democrats and Republicans will be able to work together in a bipartisan way, right? So yeah. I've, I've also anecdotally certainly experienced over the last couple of months conversations with people that, um, you know, would be both conservative, you know, both conservatives and liberals who are just tired of it, right? Mm -hmm. they're, they're, they're tired of the polarization and tired of the constant infighting. And so I don't know, are you guys seeing any of this? If you, if you think about what we saw in the midterms and then more importantly, I think from a, from a food perspective, how does this impact brands, if at all? As, as we saw kind of the pendulum swing on ESG issues and some of the other issues, companies weighed in on one side or the other. Um, is, is this real? Is it, is, it, is it not? And then what's the impact on brands? Yeah, I see it. And I, and I, I definitely see it. I don't think it's going to get any better from a government perspective. I, I think that's going to take a long time to clear up because the gridlock's going to exist. I think it's going to, and we've seen this before, I think people are have more trust that companies are going to be able to do something. Mm -hmm. And I think mm -hmm. that's going to land on brands and brands are going to be able to be able to come forward and say, okay, we're going to push in one way or another, or we're going to help with the ESG aspect or something. So I still see that as probably more so, and maybe that'll, that that's the tail that wags the rest of the dog of, of government, uh, you know, to, to, to actually work together and get something done. I don't know, Susan. Yeah. I mean, I think, I think back, that was one of our first conversations we had when we started this with um, John from civic science, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah. ESG every, and polarization. Every, if, if you, if you decided uh, if you were in the red tribe or the blue tribe, if you would yeah. tell him that he would tell you everything else about your life. Yeah. It was the most differentiating thing. Right. Um, I think people are tired of it. I, I, I'm not as close as you are to it, Kevin, in terms of food. I mean, I still think there's a reality out there that consumers do look to brands for different signaling and things that are important to them. And people do look to companies um, to, to provide leadership because the government's not getting it done. I don't really have a different perspective on that. I do think that um, on this polarization piece, I love that 74% say work together. We've somehow got to get like the fringe end folks on both sides to calm down. Um, I mean, you guys know, I, it's not food, but my beloved Tesla, um, you know, three, four months ago, everybody assumed certain liberal type things about me because I drove a Tesla. Now I'm being harassed because Elon Musk has become off the deep end. I don't, I don't even, I don't even know what censoring people and destroying Twitter and going QAnon. Um, so that's just a situation where I'm just caught in the middle and I just love my damn car and I want them to go away. I don't think we've seen that on the food. I do. I mean, but that's, I, I have a, <laughs> but that's oh, yeah. fascinating though. It's like how yeah. a brand can change so much. Mm -hmm. You don't see that too much in the food industry. Although you, you do a little, I mean, you do see brands though that have, I mean, that's the danger when a brand becomes so um, they put their heart out there or yep. they're, 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 they're mission driven is yep. that it's, it's, it's uh it, or if they're if they're a person driven, like you know, it's yeah, the head of yeah. the, the company. Yeah. That's an interesting, I mean, it's a it's a really negative tale or it's a you know very stark tale, but it's an interesting thought for for companies too. It is a thought. It's like having the discussion with my 11 year old about his Kyries. Yeah. Yeah. But that's yeah, I don't think it happens quite as much in food. I mean, but if you think about like Chick-fil-A, everybody knows they're closed on Sunday and they espouse certain views but they're wildly popular and doing really well and accepted across the board. And I think it's because they have principles, they stick to them and they don't seem punitive about it. It's like, right. this is who we are and people respect them for that. So there's a way to do it. Yeah. 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 It's interesting when you mentioned the, the issue with Tesla and, and Tesla and Elon, because historically it's been the spokesperson or the brand persona, right? So it was Jared with Subway and when that tanked and he tanked, you know, but the brand can move beyond that. It's different when you're the owner. Mm -hmm. uh, because at that point you, you are, you are the brand, right? You're not just the spokesperson for it. And it's, you can't distance yourself. You can't distance the company from it. Yeah. Right. It makes me think though, the, the, 
how much we we love the idea of the you know the 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 main leader of a company and mostly it's yep. tech you know like the Steve mm-hmm. Jobs of the world but there, that happens in food too I mean we can mm-hmm. we can all think of a couple of brands that it's very founder led and it's it speaks to that and when we hear negative news about what's happening behind the scenes then that can really taint it really quickly so it's like for a company to have long lasting health does it need to move beyond the founder in many ways because the founder can be Depends on how the founder acts. I mean, look what's happening with a certain meat company in Northwest that's, Arkansas. I was thinking the yeah. same thing. Yeah. yeah, yeah, that's exactly true. Yeah. It's the there's an old meme, milkshake duck. I don't know if you guys remember milkshake duck. No, the don't idea that milkshake, no. no. milkshake duck was this whole thing. I'm now I'm dating myself because this was like ten years ago. But it was the idea that no matter who's popular on the internet, someone that you think is like the hero, there someone's going to dig up something that they did something horribly wrong. Yeah, they're yeah. a milk sh- milkshake duck. And I think that happens with companies now. It's like, that's the danger of being very founder focused or very person focused. Interesting. I still don't, I still don't get the connection to a milkshake duck, but I'll send you the meme. I don't I'll either, but <laughs> I'll send you the meme. <laughs> All right, do that. All right. We're going to wrap up here. Susan, consumer spending um, yeah. sentiment seems to be improving at times, but spending's not what's going on. Well, I mean, the consumer has been amazing for quite some time, right? I mean, the spending yeah. has been off the hook for a couple of years now. Now, it did settle a little bit here in 2022 in t- terms of general merch. So we were still something like, I don't know, 17% higher. Some of that's inflationary than 2019, but we're a little lower than we were last year because we, we've gotten out of the house or maybe gone back to work, right? We've also bought a heck of a lot of things. Uh, Black Friday was a little soft. Um, we see the holiday, you know, people started shopping earlier, um, and food's been tough with inflation and it's still shifted towards in home. Um, but the consumer showed a tremendous amount of resilience and we all know our clients have been taking price increases all along the way. I mean, it's, things seem to be rather inelastic. What I think is going to happen is first of all, the consumer is having some spending fatigue. We're seeing it. Things are more expensive. Um, dollars are still up. Units are softening a little bit because you're paying more for everything. Yep. And but another thing that'll be interesting is as cost the CPIs and inflation starts to, it seems like it's easing a little bit. And if it comes down and starts comping over last year, it's not going to be double digits on the mm-hmm. comps. Yep. So psychologically, it's going to feel less even though it's elevated. And I think this is where we start to see a bit of a new normal because I don't think anybody's given prices back. No. I think the only thing we are going to see is you're going to have to have more innovation and smart promoting to keep the consumer spending and buying. That would be my prediction. I don't know though. I spent $9 on a bag of flour and I just about lost it. I was like, $9 seems a little much for a bag of flour. <laughs> now, was, was, was this an artisan brand of flour? Was it, no, was it King no. Arthur or was it something? No, just regular, uh, it was, like, it was a regular, or? I think it was gold metal flour. Maybe it was like, yeah. it was like eight ninety nine something like that, but it was seven. How, how, how much, how much flour? A regular yeah, five pound like, bag of flour. Really? Regular and five Nine yeah. bucks for a five pound well, bag Well, tater flour. tots market price. Right. That's right. Yeah. I was, I sent Charlie and Susan a, a, a picture of some, restaurant some diner somewhere i think in the east coast and it said tater tots market price instead mm-hmm. of giving a price so uh, yeah I, that's a whole nother conversation there's about. flies in the ointment to be sure right so first yeah. of all that was a very high level we all know that there are segments of the population that are really struggling and food insufficiency is still a really big problem yeah. so it is the higher income households that have been really propping a lot of this up but there still are surprising a fair amount of savings levels are still up um, from, from the pandemic. People are still spending. So some people are definitely hitting that wall and there's a lot of hurt out there. I think the wild card really has a lot to do with the labor market, right? Because mm-hmm. right now, yeah, you hear about all the white collar layoffs in tech, but tech's 2% of the job. Yeah, it's right. really small. Right. Yeah. It's really small. Yeah. So as long as the labor market, it's hot. I mean, you try hiring people lately, you know what's happening to your personnel budget. So people are feeling good because a lot of them are making more money. If we have some sort of landing, I don't, I'm not an economist. I don't know. 
But if the jobs starts to pull away, I think then that's where you're going to see right. a lot more of a reaction yeah. from the consumer. So brands aren't getting pricing prices back. What do we see? What are you predicting in terms of marketings and promotions, marketing and promotions? Well, I think they're going to have to promote more. It probably depends on the category that you're yeah. in to keep, I mean, everyday stuff, people got to buy everyday stuff, but um, you know, it may be more specialty items or higher level a higher cost things. Um, certainly within general merch, I think we're seeing some of that. And also you're just seeing some promotions on items that um, they were overstocked on, or they had too much of, um, you know, due to supply chain, mistimings, misfiring, the apparel industry, you know, for instance, but things that are up beauty, lipstick, want to feel good about ourselves. We don't have to wear a mask. We can go right. back outside up the, in general, things are up. Up in or general. up, up, up compared to like the last couple of years. Up compared to the last couple of years. Okay, yeah, that makes yeah. sense. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Interesting, yeah. interesting. Yeah. All right, wait. We, you guys realize we've been doing this for more than a year now. Really? Is it more than yeah. a year? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I was looking back at some some original notes back from uh, Dave and Jason, and they were December of 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 last year. So I love it. Crazy. Yeah, it's very fun. It's been great. And. And we fun. should we should tell our listeners we still have not met in person. We've not met in person. Never. Yeah. No. This is person. where the magic comes in. <laughs> Virtualness. If we meet in person, <laughs> I think it's like antimatter and matter meeting. I don't it know. Might, it won't be. It might be bad. It'll, it'll be yeah. anticlimactic at that point. Yeah. But 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 next year you'll be president of the Drippin Company Food and Beverage <laughs> right. Practice. No, that's exciting. So that is exciting. So, <laughs> it is exciting. Wow. You heard it here Thanks first. for the void of confidence in me, Charlie. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. It'll, it'll become the new. I, I can see the logos, right? And yeah. you'll be wearing all hip clothes and a little faucet with the a Drippin drip Company. Yeah. Drippin. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, we're dripping. dripping. Cool. Yeah. All right. Well, thanks, guys. Appreciate it. Happy New Year. Happy holidays to you and your families. And we don't. We don't have a listening. holiday with the food, really. Well, we do have a with the food. We yes, do. I'm we do. So, I'm That's sorry. Okay. No, 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 no. Maybe we should do it. It's only it, two minutes over our normal. Is it a contest? I, oh, ooh, is it a contest? contest? Of course, oh, it's yes. a contest. Yes. You guys yes. like contests. Okay. So it's a holiday. Holiday. So this is like a true false type thing to see whether or not I, you know, I'm bamboozling you or not. So this is a holiday. You're very good at it. We believe everything you say. All right. All right. Here we go. Did you get it out of the chat bot? I did not. I should have. Oh. I should have. Okay. All right. Tom and Jerry, the drink. Tom and Jerry. Oh, yes. Is oh, named after Tom and Jerry, the cat and mouse cartoon. True false. or false? False. Susan? I was going to say false, but do I have to say true because he said it first? No, no, no. It is false. It was invented actually in the 1820s. Who was oh. the original Tom and Jerry? Well, no. So it was, it was invented by this British writer named Pierce Egan, and he wrote a stage play that they turned into a play called Tom and Jerry. And he... In, they invented the eggnog kind of version of that, the warm eggnog, mm. Tom and Jerry, to kind of talk about the play. So it's basically oh. from the 1820s. So it was very a promotion good. for a it play. It was a promotion. Yes. How about promotion that? basically How about play. That? Okay. Uh, next one. In Scandinavia, there is a, a, a Christmas tradition to make saffron cookies and leave them out for the Christmas demons to avoid bad luck. Mm. There are, I know in Germany, there is the Krampus and the demon. True. I'm going to say true because yeah, I think there I, are I, Christmas I'm, demons. I'm going to say true too. I don't. I, yeah. there, there's something about the saffron in there. There, there's that might be a, that might be a trick. But, but I'm that was a trick. Shoe? That Did was a trick. Shoe? It's false. Yeah. Oh, because of the saffron. Yeah, it's not true. So the truth is, there's a tradition in Scandinavia to make very rich rice pudding to leave it out for mischievous house elves. Oh, those darn, I don't know those darn mischievous house elves. They, I just hate it when they get loose. Yeah, they exactly. do. It's oh, a problem. This one, this one, Susan, I'm looking at you because I think oh. that you're in this neck of the woods. So this okay. one you should get. Okay. In some parts of Wisconsin, it's common to serve spiced raw beef sandwiches for Christmas accompanied by raw onions on an open-faced rye bread. True. That true. is a Wisconsin thing. Wisconsin. 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 And by Wisconsin. the way, that's a very different culture than Michigan. I know. I know. I wasn't implying that it was. But I think they do that with the raw onion with the raw meat. Yes. So does, the, does the raw yeah. onion then make the raw meat? Does it kill the pathogens in it? Or no. Just, no. no. It in not. fact, in okay. fact, what happened was is that that's that, the, the beer. Wisconsin, Wisconsin is actually the, their their food safety has actually come out and said. We don't recommend eating these, what they call yeah, cannibal sandwiches or tiger meat sandwiches. Sometimes yeah, I've heard of call. tiger meat sandwiches, not cannibal mm, sandwiches. No. But yeah, I, All right. I can see no. where you Last one. Don't, no. don't eat okay, this. Okay. Last one. Before poinsettias became the Christmas plant in the mm. U.S. Did you know it's pepper, also a drink? Pepper plants 
like plants. hot pepper plants oh. were popular Christmas decorations. True. Susan? I'll say false. No, it's true. So because they turned from green to red yep. in the early, in the late 19th century, early 20th centuries, they were the Christmas plant until uh, poinsettias got like bred to be like almost, you can't kill them. Uh, then they, then, then, then that became, they kind of went away, but there was a time when no one ate them because no one would eat spice back then very much, but they definitely, but they, spread, they had them for decoration. Yeah. So. So I, if you'll indulge me, it's not food related, but I have a, a kind of a cool Christmas connection. Yes. I am friends with, and I just spent a lovely evening with the daughter of the gentleman who created Rudolph the Red-Nosed Reindeer. Really? No way. Yes, Very this cool. is true. What's so her father's name was Robert L. May. Hmm. Her name is Betsy May. She's now Betsy Decker. She lives in a suburb of Illinois. Um, I've known her family since the early nineties. I actually worked for her husband. They would have me over to play with the kids and have margaritas. And there was a year round picture of Rudolph in their living room <laughs> and me being oh, so self-aware never asked about it. I mm -hmm. was like, well, they just like Christmas. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And they never said anything to me about it. Well, several, like five, six years after I knew him. I was living in Evanston and I volunteered at the Evan His Evanston Historical Society because that's what kind of nerdy 20 something year old I was. Mm -hmm. And the director says, well, uh, for our Christmas um, uh, event tonight, we're having the daughter of Robert L. May, who, who created um, Rudolph. And I understand you know them. And I'm like... <laughs> Her father created, this is why the picture was in the room. So he was a copywriter. It was wow. originally, he, he worked for Montgomery Ward in Chicago, and it was originally a Christmas promotion. And then the character then was, you know, the spinoffs were made, the song, the TV show, and, and all of that. But it was originally part of a, a Christmas promotion. Their so it was did. consumerism. It was consumerism. consumerism. Isn't that interesting? It is, that interesting. is interesting. Yeah. Very interesting. Kev Kevin, what else would it have been? I mean, really? Well, I know. I mean, the, the current vision we think of Santa Claus was invented by Coca-Cola. So, yeah. Really? There you go. Yeah, because the original Sinterklaas or like was an elf that looked not so good, but it was redone <laughs> by uh, Charles. Was he German Charles Krampus? Nash. Yeah. No, no. Krampus is different. Krampus takes away the bad boys and girls. Oh, okay. Uh, but no, the original elf was redesigned by uh, Nash was his name for Coca-Cola in that red outfit, jolly elf. Because even if you read uh, a night, uh, what do you call it? The night the before poem. Christmas. The night before Christmas poem. It doesn't sound like the Santa we know. It no. was redesigned no. for Coca Cola, and mm -hmm. that has become the vision that we now think of. So, consumerism. very interesting. Yeah, yeah. Huh. it is. Interesting. If Krampus was real, then teenagers would be gone. Right? <laughs> right, there would be no more teenagers. So <laughs> that would be a danger. That would be. I'm, I'm so looking forward to that, you guys. I've determined the fragrance of middle school. Oh Are yeah. You ready? yeah. 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 Tell me. Tell us. It's a combination of old spice cracking guard and flatulence. Oh, <laughs> very good. Good, good, good. Well, so so my, my wife spent 20 years in a middle school. Uh -huh. she was tw 20 years in seventh grade. Oof. And uh finally graduated. And I could hardly stand to walk in the building because you would you would you oh. would be alternating fog of axe body spray yes. and body odor. Right. Yes. So it just kind of dependent on which wave you were riding yeah. as you walked. What time of day? School. Yeah. yeah. So. Yeah. Well, well, with that in, have too. a happy holidays, everyone. <laughs> oh, motherhood. Merry Christmas. Happy holidays. <laughs> Merry we'll Christmas. We'll see you in 2023. Take no, care. no, Bye -bye. no, no. Well, oh. we'll, we'll we won't see each other in 2023. We're gonna break the spell, but we do right. wish everyone well. Yes. Right. Bye. Okay. All right. See you guys. Happy Thank you. Bye. 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 Bye.